Good morning. Good morning and welcome to this Conservation Applied Research and Development or CARD webinar on the energy efficiency opportunity potential at Minnesota Water Utilities. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Mary Sue Lobenstein, and I'm the Energy Conservation and Research Planner at the Minnesota Department of Commerce Division of Energy Resources. Um, in that role, I identify and analyze gaps within utility conservation improvement programs and coordinate and plan research to fill those gaps. The CARD program is a major tool of that work. With me today is Lindsay Anderson. Lindsay is a state program administrator principal at the Department of Commerce. Lindsay provides project development support, program evaluation, and public information coordination for programs that are related to statewide industrial, commercial, and residential building energy efficiency, as well as for energy assurance. Lindsay is the project manager of this CARD research and will be handling the Q&A on the webinar. Our presenter today is Brent Vinzanko from the Minnesota Technical Assistance Program at the University of Minnesota. Brent has been with MINTAP for over four years where he pursues his passion for water conservation and waste reduction. Brent was the principal investigator on the study being discussed today. Also on hand for our webinar is Carl DeWall, who is a senior engineer at MINTAP, where he has been assisting businesses and industries for over 20 years with questions on industrial cleaning processes, industrial water use, and energy efficiency. Carl conducted the analyses and assessment tasks of this research project and will be available for the Q&A portion of today's presentation. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few webinar basics, some of which, most of which, you'll, most of you are probably familiar with at this point. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. We will answer all questions at the end of the presentation, but as questions occur to you, please do type them into the Q&A box, the Q&A box, not the chat box, and send them to all panelists. We will do our best to answer all questions within the time allocated, but if we don't get to some of them, we will answer them after the webinar and send those out to people. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the department's website. The slide set from this webinar will also be available. Just for some context, this webinar is one in an ongoing series that is designed to summarize results from research projects that are funded by Minnesota's Applied Research and Development Fund. And that fund was established in the Next Generation Energy Act of 2007. The purpose of the fund is to help Minnesota utilities achieve their energy savings goals. About 2.6 million is set aside annually for the CARD program and that program awards research grants in a competitive request for proposal process. Results from CARD projects provide utilities with data to enhance energy efficiency program designs within their conservation improvement program portfolios. As you can see by this pie chart, CARD projects funded to date have been in all building sectors, as well as some that cross multiple sectors. The subject of today's webinar addresses the industrial sector and will discuss results from a two-year research project which sought to define energy use and efficiency opportunities for a municipal drinking water supply operation. Now I'm going to turn it over to Brent for today's presentation. All right, thanks Mary Sue and thanks everybody for joining. Uh, like Mary Sue said, my name is Brent Mazanko and I, uh, I have been working at the Minnesota Technical Assistance Program or MINTAP at the University of Minnesota for about four years-ish now. Um, and the topic we'll be talking about today um, is energy efficiency in the drinking water treatment sector of Minnesota. So we'll start here with a quick overview of what we'll be talking about. Uh, we'll start with some background information just to kind of get us all on the same foot with regards to the, the sector. Uh, and then we'll present findings on the literature review, the informational interviews, and the technical assessment, assessments. And then from there, we'll finish up with conclusions um, both about the opportunities that we found, as well as how electric utilities can help push implementation of these in the in the sector. So, um, the first kind of basic piece of information is how does a how does a water treatment plant operate? Well, um, there's three major tasks that each plant does. Um, 
the first acquisition. So they acquire the water by pumping it from uh, either the well, either the groundwater or a surface water source. Um, from there, it gets treated, which uh, disinfects and or filters the, the water so that it can be safely used by customers. Uh, and then it gets distributed um, to the customers and then also to water towers and storage reservoirs. So I think it will be helpful to do a little bit of discussion on units. So these units you'll see throughout the presentation. Um, and so hopefully that can kind of keep us all on the same page. So first one here is MG or million gallons. Uh, the next one is kind of follows right after that is MGY, which is million gallons per year. Uh, kind of a quick example and a nice piece of information to know. Um, the average plant in Minnesota pumps 280 million gallons per year uh, of treated water. So that might come in handy later on in the presentation as well. And then the um, kind of final thought on units is this concept of specific energy. Uh, and this is a term that we use throughout the presentation. Uh, and it and it refers to the energy required to do you know do something to a certain amount of water. Uh, in most cases, we're talking about pumping it. Uh, we, you know that's that's a large portion of what these plants do. Um, but sometimes we use it in the context of treatment as well. So um, you know it can be used in any way um, in that regard. And then the units for this is kilowatt hours per million gallons. Um, we'll use that throughout. So here's a quick snapshot of drinking water facilities uh, in the state. So most utilities use groundwater. Uh, 537 of the 558 use groundwater as a source. Uh, 17 use surface water and uh, four, of, four of them use both groundwater and surface water. And then out of the 558 sites in the state, 53% uh, produce 92% of the water. Um, you know, we'll we'll present on the next slide. We'll do a little bit more with those kind of numbers. But you know, a big portion of the water being pumped in the state are pumped by a small fraction, or a little bit more than 50% of the facilities in the state. And then the corollary to that, or kind of the the reciprocal, is that 47% of the utilities produce less than 50 million gallons per year individually. So this just kind of points that there are a lot of small plants in the state. And the next slide will we'll show that a little bit better as well. Okay, so uh, here you can see kind of starting off with the first column there, um, small, medium, and large. This is how we broke down the different size classes. Um, and you can see a lot of the a lot of the plants in the state are in that small or medium sized category, pumping less than 500 million gallons per year. Um, about I think it was 87 percent of the of the sites fall into those two categories. Um, but what's really impressive here, I think, is that. Um, those 70 sites in the large category pump 72% uh, of the water and use an estimated 78% of the energy in, in a year. Um, and so what this kind of points towards is that large plants are probably a good target for energy efficiency. Um, but we'll go into a little bit more detail on how, how that breaks down in, in different ways as well. So. The, so moving on from the background information, the first part of the study that we did started with um, the literature review, um, which was a review of kind of the current and pertinent literature surrounding energy efficiency in the drinking water treatment um, sector. Um, one of the major findings that we had from this was this breakdown in the pie chart shown here of the different energy uses by category, so distribution, acquisition, and treatment. Um, what we found here was that distribution uh, was shown to be the largest portion of this, followed by acquisition, and then really followed followed up by treatment. Uh, we found that treatment was a very small portion of the pie, which meant it wasn't a huge focus of our project. We'll go into a little bit more detail about that later, but um, you know, just starting from here, it's pretty obvious that treatment is not a huge, a huge portion of the energy pie here. Okay, so. I won't go through each of these, and I know this the the 
font on here is not huge, but this is a list um, of the best practices that we found through our literature review. This list of um, 12 best practices was what really kind of pushed us into the next step, the informational interviews. And these this list of 12 best practices got turned into five vetted opportunities, um, which we kind of went with through the rest of the rest of the project. So moving on from the um, literature review, we moved into the informational interview part of the process. Um, this, these were used to confirm the information that we found in the literature review and to figure out what was specifically applicable to Minnesota. Um, the literature review did not find a lot of things pertinent exactly to Minnesota, and so that's kind of the gap that this, this research was trying to fill. And then the other kind of main piece of the informational interviews was uh, to gain more detailed understanding of the sector and how each um, plant operates. So we interviewed a total of 22 organizations. This included 15 water utilities, three energy utilities, two well drillers, and then two partners, which were the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of Health. Um, the water utilities were selected on four criteria listed here. Um, water source, which was groundwater or surface water, yearly production, uh, location, and then this internally developed method, the universal well metric. Uh, these four criteria were selected to produce a representative cross section of the state's water utilities. A little bit more background on the universal well metric uh, because people might not be familiar with it. It was developed um, internally by our, our group to provide an estimation of acquisition energy. But it was determined later on that it was fairly flawed in its in its kind of accuracy and estimation of that. And so um, we found later on kind of through hindsight that a better representation would have been pumping level. Um, but these data are not readily available. Um, and so they're not uh, an easy piece of data to find. And so. Um, kind of as a final conclusion on all of this, uh, the universal well metric might have been flawed, but we still feel like these three other criteria um, still provide a good cross section of the state, and that the conclusion that we draw throughout the um, project are still useful to the rest of the state. So here's a kind of a quick table, kind of looking at the different um, criteria that we discussed above. So what we found was that um, small sites were fairly difficult to recruit. Um, I don't think this is a surprise uh, to anyone. Uh, and then that we were able to kind of backfill those spots with large sites. Um, the large sites typically had a little bit more time to devote to our interview process. And so that was kind of a, a nice way to, to kind of fill in those spots. Totals at the bottom of the of the table um, indicate that the sites that we found were pretty well distributed throughout the state, or at least they were well distributed in the four quadrants, the Northeast, Northwest, Southeast, and Southwest, and then the Metro as well. And so um, just to kind of um, wrap everything up on this, so the 14 the number of uh, total sites in this table includes all of the groundwater sites that we interviewed. Uh, we did interview one surface water site, which was um, categorized as a large site in the Northwest. So once the sites were selected and interviewed, uh, those data were compiled and then conclusions were drawn on those. And so that's what we'll kind of go over in the next couple of slides. Uh, the first major conclusion that we came to was that overall plant configuration was extremely variable. Uh, what we found were that, you know, some sites treated their water kind of as it was pumped from the well into the storage tanks. Um, this was kind of the simplest system that we found, uh, you know, chemicals were just added in line and there was no extra pumping needed to get it to the um, water towers, which is a distribution network. This was kind of going up the level of complexity to uh, some sites had a filtration system, some sites had lime softening to um, soften the water at the plant. And then some sites, well, one site that we looked at um, had a reverse osmosis system to better treat their water um, before it went out to, to customers. 
So these different styles obviously had a big effect on overall energy use. Um, and that we'll kind of go into later on as well. Um, but we still also backed up the fact from the literature review that treatment was still a small portion and small enough to be um, not quite a big focus of the study. And then we also found that uh, size has a fairly big impact as well on overall specific energy, um, which we'll discuss in the next two slides. Uh, we found that medium sized facilities, this 50 to 500 million gallons per year site had the lowest average specific energy and also the lowest range. So the lowest high value as well as the lowest low value. Uh, we, we kind of hypothesize that this is a Goldilocks type of situation um, where these medium sized plants benefit from economies of scale that the small plants do not, uh, but they don't have all the overhead that the large plants might have um, in their systems. We also found that large plants did have the highest range, um, you know, the high and the low, but this also does include the one reverse osmosis plant that we that we interviewed. And so, um, you know, that could have have that could skew the results slightly. Okay. So next we looked at how each stage acquisition, treatment and distribution contributed to energy use. And so what we found here was that treatment again was a little bit more than expected. I think here it's average about 14% of the total energy use, but still a fairly low portion uh, low portion of that total. Um, these data also show that there is not a huge difference between size classes for each stage, except for what we showed uh, in the previous slide with the different overalls. Um, you know, the um, the portion of each stays the same mostly within the different size categories. Um, I will also just throw the caveat out there that these numbers and these data probably have some of the more uncertainty in the in the different pieces of data that we calculated, just because um, taking energy data from overall energy meters and overall flow data and trying to calculate out the different stages was a little bit challenging at times and, and um, definitely put some uncertainty into these numbers. So this is the kind of final big table here with uh, looking at treatment, so the different treatment styles and how they impact the different stages as well as the overall treatment uh, specific energy. And so what we found here is that um, the treatment specific energy does go up as you increase the treatment complexity. And so, you know, the treat at the well systems where they treat, you know, they add chemicals in line, they had no treatment energy uh, associated with that. And then going up the line, filtration and lime softening are very similar complexity levels. A lot of a lot of the work in those two systems are done with gravity. Um, and then reverse osmosis has kind of the highest energy use, which makes sense with the pressure required to pump through the filters that they use. Um, we also see here that acquisition and distribution stay relatively constant, again, within kind of error bars here. Um, except for the treat at the well systems, which um, again was fairly difficult to just, you know, kind of distinguish between acquisition and distribution just because, you know, the well pump was doing all of the work uh, and we had to kind of draw a line at some point. So um, that, that, that's why those numbers are a little bit lower, I think, than the filtration lime softening and reverse osmosis. So the final output then from the informational interviews was this list of five energy efficiency opportunities that apply to Minnesota drinking water treatment facilities. And so the first one here is pump efficiency optimization. Uh, this is it's specifically the prioritization of the most efficient wells or distribution pumps uh, at any given time. Um, and this reduces energy use by um, you know, just having the most efficient pumps running at, at a given time. And so this is best done using, again, specific energy um, calculated using real time energy and flow data for each pump in the system to give kind of real time data on efficiency. The second one here is well and or pump rehabilitation. Typically, they kind of come together. Um, and this is the periodic maintenance of wells and pumps throughout the facility, just to ensure that proper operating conditions are achieved in each pump and well. 
Um, this is typically done the, what we found on a kind of seven to 10 year rotation, um, but could also be done using specific energy as a benchmark to identify deteriorating pumps. This is not something we found in our interviews, but it's something that we um, think could be a, a, a good opportunity. The third is water loss reduction. Uh, this is the um, kind of the reduction of water that doesn't make it to a customer. So water like um, water that's you know escaping with the leaks or water that is used um, you know kind of in the treatment process and then disposed of, um, or kind of other uh, other factors as well. And this this one really relies on the fact that every gallon of processed water that you can save. Um, the treatment facility will save a corresponding number of kilowatt hours. Uh, again, going back to the specific energy. And then the fourth one here um, is pretty similar to the third, except now we're looking at trying to reduce the amount of water that customers use. Uh, and this again relies on that system that, you know, for every gallon saved, there's a corresponding kilowatt hours that are saved as well. And then the final opportunity here is VFD optimization, and this refers to the tuning of, of a VFD with respect to the exact pumping conditions that are seen at that pump um, to kind of increase incrementally increase the efficiency of the pump and VFD system. Okay, so moving on to the assessments, um, you know, we had the opportunities identified. And so what we did with the assessments is we selected five sites to perform, um, you know, these in-depth assessments. Each assessment was analyzed, sorry, each opportunity was analyzed at either one, two, or three assessment sites. Um, so some assessment sites had multiple opportunities that we were identifying. Um, and this depended, you know, how many sites were assessing each opportunity was dependent on complexity and promise of that opportunity. The final bullet here, um, COVID-19 did bar us from doing these assessments on site. Um, so data was gathered by emails, Zoom calls and phone calls instead of in-person visits like we had planned to at the beginning. I will just put out there too, this, we don't feel like this really impacted negatively the results that we found. Um, but it did make it a little bit more challenging to get the data that we needed. So this is really the, this is probably why everyone came to the webinar here. This is like the big table of all of the data that we calculated in the assessments. So um, the opportunities here are arranged in order from most to least opportunity, starting with pump efficiency optimization at 25 million kilowatt hours of statewide potential per year. Um, all the way down to VFD optimization and then the total of 42 million kilowatt hours per year of um, statewide opportunity potential. So the next thing we'll do here is we'll um, kind of discuss each opportunity in more detail, including um, the specific savings um, for each of them, as well as how an electric utility would identify these and then how an electric utility could incentivize um, implementation of each of these. So the first opportunity, like we talked about earlier, is pump efficiency optimization. So again, just to refamiliarize ourselves with this, um, this is the um, picking the most efficient pump or well so that you can increase your overall system efficiency. And so this, this applies to both well pumps as well as distribution pumps. Um, so acquisition and distribution pumps and um, what we saw is that uh, well pumps tended to have a little bit higher uh, savings than distribution pumps, and this is just because there's larger discrepancies in efficiencies overall in well pumps. And so, you know, estimated savings on the well pumps is 5% and the estimated savings on distribution is a little bit under a percent. And so these two also kind of in the column before that have a large percentage of sites, about 87% of sites in the state that could um, benefit from these opportunities. And so that's where you get kind of the higher estimated sector potential. And then the final row here is pump redesign. This is uh, kind of referring to um, putting the right pump in the right application. And so this option definitely has a smaller portion of the state that can take advantage of it with only 10%. 
but if identified uh, along with other opportunities could could provide a fairly big um, fairly good savings number so the second opportunity we'll discuss here is well and or pump rehabilitation And so well and rehab well and pump rehab is again the periodic maintenance of um, the well and the pump um, to restore the operation of both to near uh, original efficiency. And so this usually includes kind of if it's a well pulling the the pump out of the well, identifying which parts of it need to be replaced, and then replacing those parts or replacing the pumps that you can. Um, to return to better efficiency and kind of reduce the wear on that on that system. And so this is really a necessary piece of any water treatment plants plan. And I think that's why we saw many, many sites that have this seven to 10 year rotation that they do. And um, what we found, so, so this seven to 10 year rotation, what we found, um, you know, again, a lot of the sites in the state are doing this. Um, the estimated savings is about 6%. Um, which gives you a fairly good, um, you know, sector potential. But what we also found is that um, if if a site was able to monitor their specific energy of each of the pumps and wells, then they would be able to increase that that savings by about one or two percent by knowing the precise time when they were able to or when they needed to rehab that pump or well. So the Third opportunity here is water loss reduction. And water loss reduction again is the kind of focused, um, the focused look at water that is not making it to the customer and the reduction of those of those pieces. And so um, what we kind of found from different data sources is that there's kind of five main pieces of this um, distribution leak repair, hydrant repair. Treatment efficiency, pressure control, and storage mixing. So these kind of top three um, distribution leak repair, hydrant repair, and treatment losses represent 99% of the savings in this category. But if the last two are identified, they should certainly still be um, considered as as relevant sources of savings. The other fact uh, of the top three as well is that. It's a fairly low uptake in the state currently. And so 95, 96, and 87% respectively for the top three uh, facilities in the state are able to take advantage of these opportunities. And looking at the estimated savings, you know, some sites saw on, you know, on order of 2.5 to 31% of their losses could be saved by by looking at it more closely. And so I think that this is a really good, this and customer conservation are both really good opportunities to look at. Um, they're pretty low, low capital, low, low work um, op opportunities. And then the fourth one, uh, like I just mentioned is customer conservation. So customer conservation, again, is very much like water loss reduction, except now we're looking at reducing customer water use. And so this is split up into three different categories. Each of the categories is a different rebate opportunity. And so the first one uh, is irrigation, which includes irrigation controllers and, and low flow irrigation heads. The next one is residential appliances, which typically, typically includes you know, dishwashers, clothes washers, sinks, those types of things. And then the third one is other, which includes a lot of the commercial, industrial, and residential water savings, which is a little bit harder to kind of pin down. And so, um, again, these are all rebates that the water utility offers to their customers. Uh, the nice thing about these uh, kind of opportunities is that there's only about 6% of the state currently that has a robust plan in place to reduce customer you know, water use. And so there's a, a very large number of sites in the state that still have the opportunity to do this um, and see significant savings through this. I will also just make the point here that this is a little bit trickier, a little bit tricky to implement. And just because um, you know, customer uh, customer water use is their main source of revenue um, for the for the water utility. And so it can be a little bit harder to 
make the case that this is a good idea. Um, but, you know, looking at the energy saved at the treatment plant versus the revenue loss, I think is a, an important thing to look at. Okay, so, and our final opportunity here is VFD optimization. And VFD optimization, again, is um, the optimization of the VFD and pump that, you know, to the current pumping conditions that that pump is in. So what we found in our interviews is that I think it was 90% of the, of the pumps that we found had VFDs on them. So pretty good uptake on VFDs in, in the sector, which is great, but not a lot of the VFDs were being used um, in the most efficient way possible. So most of them were being used as a soft start, which is great to reduce demand, but and then also as kind of a, a little bit of a demand reduction as well by just setting this, you know, the speed down a little bit um, and compensating by a little bit more runtime. And so what we found is that these VFDs can be used to find the pump's best operating point for the pumping conditions that the pump is in. And this would save kind of on average one and a half percent of that, that pumping energy. And so I think that this one kind of falls into the category of, you know, if there's if there's a assessment already being completed, that this is something that you know somebody would look for as kind of an add-on. I don't think it's necessarily something to target, but I think it would be really good um, to look for when, you know, when on when on site. Okay, so those are the five opportunities that we identified. So where do we go from here? Well, um, the, we learned a lot of things through our interview process and our assessment process. And so, you know, one of the major, two of the major things we learned were the kind of uh, motivators for the industry, as well as the main barriers. So the, the major motivators for the industry um, is water quality, um, the quality that the, you know, the quality of water that the customer is getting, uh, pump reliability, this goes kind of hand in hand with that, you know, getting water to a customer is the number one priority. So making sure that all of their pumps and, and wells are running well is a huge is a huge motivator. And then system efficiency, I think, is still there as well. Um, but these top two really do come, come first. And then the major barriers, um, I think cost is a major barrier. And then time commitment. I mean, that's uh, having the time to commit to energy efficiency is, is really is really difficult, especially in those smaller and, and medium sized plants. Uh, and then uncertainty, I think this goes with water quality and well reliability as well. Um, you know, they want to make sure that what they're implementing is going to work and that they're going to be able to provide water to where it needs to go. And so I think that these, this discussion kind of leads to the question of how does an electric utility kind of help incentivize this sector um, to reduce their energy use? And so, you know, one of the major themes that we identified uh, in the solutions that we developed rely mostly on behavioral changes um, based on pump efficiency data. And so, you know, the three bullet points on the bottom here, pump efficiency optimization, well pump rehabilitation, and water loss reduction, they all really rely on that um, specific energy monitoring. So, again, measurement is really the foundational step and required to not only identify the opportunity, but also to demonstrate the impact of the changes that have been made. So, um, I think as an example here, uh, to go through the top bullet points here, take you know pump, pump efficiency optimization. So the prioritization of pumps uh, as an example. So in order for a water utility to realize the savings for that, uh, they would need to pick the most efficient pumps on a regular basis. So the most effective way that they can do this is to measure the pump's energy draw as well as its flow flow rates, and then calculate a specific energy on the on a per pump basis. And so once they get that specific energy, they can compare that to the other pumps in the in the network, and then decide which one is the most efficient and run those prior you know kind of before they run the other ones. And so, you know, going through the top lit, the kind of top list of bullets here, and again, this is uh, not again, but kind of to put this into context here, uh, this is kind of similar to a compressed air audit uh, incentive structure. And so the way that we envisioned this working 
is that the water utility would install, buy and install the measuring equipment. This would be similar to, uh, say, an industrial customer paying for an audit um, to, to happen, a compressed air audit to happen at their facility. So the water utility buys the measurement equipment. Um, they, they implement whatever efficiency opportunity that they are looking to do. So they, you know, again, back to pump efficiency optimization, they install the equipment and then they prioritize the most efficient pumps. And then once that they have verified that those savings are actually there for their system, they get reimbursed by the electric utility for um, all or a portion of the measurement equipment cost. Um, I would say the one potential downside to this is just really the time necessary to verify that those savings are there. Um, it could be potentially one to four years to ensure that you know you get a good baseline and then you can further justify um, the savings that are there. So this table really pulls all of the opportunities together along with the identification method for the electric utility or for really any technical assistance provider, uh, the method for electric utilities to uh, incentivize these savings, and then the potential, again, um, the opportunity for each of these opportunities, the opportunity potential <laughs> for each of these opportunities. And so, again, the measurement incentive discussed earlier on the previous slide are really applied to the top three here. Um, and then the last two require a little bit more input from the electric utility to help make sure that the water utility is really able to um, realize the full savings that they that they should. So for customer conservation, the electric utility could help with um, outreach. So kind of on a partnership basis, um, especially if territories overlap, this might be kind of a symbiotic relationship. Um, and then they could also provide pass through money for equipment rebates. Um, such as kind of irrigation controllers and um, water efficient appliances. For VFD optimization, um, this might require a little bit more in-depth technical assistance, which is why I kind of um, mentioned this, you know, it's kind of, it could be a good add-on, you know, if there's, an, if there's a site assessment happening um, and you're finding other things, I think VFDs are a good thing to check um, while doing that. And then the identification of each. So in most of these cases, um, they each of these apply to more than half of the state. You know, the top three apply to about 50% of the state, and then the bottom two really apply to really the bottom three. So water loss reduction and customer conservation and BFD optimization apply to a good majority of the state. So um, they should be fairly readily available if if electric utilities are, are willing and able to look for them. Um, the first two um, would benefit from previously installed measurement systems um, on specific pumps, but uh, like we talked about, could be incentivized on a kind of um, compressed air style um, rebate opportunity. And then for water loss reduction and customer conservation, again, only a really small fraction of the state is doing these. And so I think these are a really easy way to start out and to kind of find out where the opportunity is um, and kind of kind of help the help the sector start with uh, energy conservation. And then VFT optimization, like I said, should be looked at when other opportunities are being looked at. And so just to kind of conclude here, um, the biggest opportunities that we found were pump efficiency optimization and pump and well rehab. And the overall sector potential is 42 million kilowatt hours per year. Um, I will say that I would think this is probably a little bit of a conservative estimate just because, um, you know, we, we looked at 15 interviews and we extrapolated data from those. I think this is a really great place to start, um, but that could that number could definitely be refined with some of those kind of lower on the list opportunities. All opportunities rely on specific energy. So we're coming full circle here. Um, specific energy, this kilowatt hours per million gallons is really a key metric that we found to be really, really helpful for all opportunities and fairly necessary for others. Um, you know, again, monitoring the flow rate and monitoring the energy draw 
on specific pumps and motors is really a key piece to not only identifying opportunities, but also verifying the results of these opportunities. And then as a kind of little final piece of information to chew on here, um, demand charges, this is something we found kind of irrespective of a lot of things here, but uh, what, what we talked about earlier, but demand charges uh, on multiple wells can create this energy efficiency disincentive. And so something that we have kind of tried to push a little bit is that um, energy or electric utilities should be looking at trying to meter um, electric utility or water utilities as a whole, because sometimes um, when you have multiple wells on different meters, you're being charged for demand on all of them, which creates a little bit of a, a difficulty to implement some of these opportunities. So I won't say anything more on that. We can talk about it in the Q&A section next um, if there's interest, but I think that's all I have. So we can move in. Uh, I'll give it back to Mary Sue and we can move to the Q&A session. Great, great. Thanks, Brent, for that great presentation. If you have not already done so, please type any additional questions into the Q&A box and send them to all panelists. Lindsay, do you have any questions for Brent or Carl? Yes, I do. I, I do. Um, the first question here is, are there companies that conduct water audits in the same way that compressed air audits are done? Um. Uh, I don't know if I want to start with with us, but Mintap does this. Um, <laughs> we we definitely can. We'll look at water opportunities um, and energy opportunities at really any industry, um, but pr primarily industrial facilities. So yes, um, there are there are places. I don't know of any others than than Mintap though. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question, can you provide more detail on how the overall Minnesota drinking water treatment estimated total energy and energy savings potential was calculated? And you had mentioned being potentially conservative in some areas, if you want to expound on any of those points. Sure. Um, Mary Sue, are you able to go back a couple slides and just kind of get to that? Let's see, I think it was, I think it was, um, would have been 18 in my slide set. So just before the opportunity started. I think it's the, couple more, couple more after this one. Um, but as she's finding that, so, um, basically, the kind of route that we took to calculate these different opportunities was, um, you know, we took we took a look at the interview data, which was, um, you know, what how many sites are doing each. Um, and Mary Sue, I think it's like three or four slides from here. Past this, beyond yes. this, I think not so, before. Yeah. Okay, here. That one, yes, that's exactly the one. So. Um, for a lot of them, we looked at interview data and kind of extrapolated what portion of the state would be um, would be needing to do these opportunities, or really what what portion of the state has done these opportunities. Um, and then again, we extrapolated that out from to the rest of the state using kind of the assumption that our interview sites were a good representation of the state. Um, we did those, we did that for the first, let's see, for the pump efficiency optimization, well pump rehab and VFD optimization. Um, for the water loss reduction and the customer conservation opportunities, we looked at um, data provided by the DNR. Um, we are very thankful to have um, been provided a lot of really awesome data from the DNR. Um, so we looked at some, some customer conservation data that they had collected from their um, from their users, which um, their their role in this, and I, I hope I get this right, but um, they they pretty much permit the acquisition of water, and so they are able to kind of gather data on that side of things, which was really great. We had access to a lot of that, so you know we kind of started with how many how many facilities in the state do we think could benefit from this opportunity, and then from the assessments we took, um, 
or from the, you know, again, from the five assessments that we did, we were able to calculate what kind of savings we would estimate for each of the opportunities. And then from there, you know, it's kind of a, a simple multiplication to get the, the total, the total sector opportunity. And then I think the second part of the question was kind of where do you think there could be more opportunity available? Um, I think that the customer conservation and water loss reduction are really kind of wide ranges. So, I mean, if we, if you look at the, the, the savings values, um, for water loss reduction, I mean, it was like 2 and a half to 31% of their losses. They could a, a single utility could save. And so I think that that is probably a place, um, where there could be more savings than we're putting here. We took a, a conservative average of those numbers and got the values that we found. But again, you know, with 95% of the state not doing, not really having a robust plan to mitigate leaks, um, <laughs> you know, kind of the sky's the limit on that one. Uh, it could really go up or down pretty quickly, I think. Excellent. Um, are there any plans to study how to run your water plant when time of use electric electric rates come down the pipeline? Um, there is no, there are no current plans. I don't think um, with Mintap, but that is, we definitely saw that in a couple of facilities and and actually, specifically, we we did have a couple of facilities that we looked at. Um, we looked at um, different rate structures. Um, you know, looking at whether a combined, um, like a, a combined rate of like demand and and usage kind of combined into one, a blended rate versus demand and usage being separate. And I don't remember exactly. I might turn this over to Carl. I think he has more more thoughts on that, but. You know, the demand structure is definitely something that could, or the, the rate structure is definitely something that could be looked into and could potentially provide some incentive for electric or water utilities to, to kind of uptake these opportunities. I don't know, Carl, do you have anything else to add on that one? I, I guess in, in terms of, of looking at it, uh, you know, I don't think that the uh, card grants would, would look at this because it's, uh, you know, be load shifting as opposed to energy savings. Of uh, it, it, it would be important for the water utilities, uh, just like demand charge management is important for them. They actually have probably a, a greater purport potential to do demand saving reduction as opposed to energy in, in terms of the dollar impacts. Um, I guess that's um, I guess that's what I that's what I can add. Okay, thank you. Um, this question it came in more of a, of as a comment, um, but if uh, there were if Mintap had any um, reaction to this um, based off of literature or interviews. Um, that would be interesting to note. So um, the comment is um, pump optimization is tricky. Some cities have wells with various levels of water quality. Um, for example, there's a city with um, excellent wells that are good producers. However, um, they um, also have some naturally occurring arsenic that they deal with. So they blend it with other well water. Um, these wells are not as productive. Um, is there any consideration um, to share related to this comment? Yeah, this is a really good observation and a, and a really interesting thing that we found throughout our study. You know, the it, it, it always seems that the and, you know, the, I think they mentioned they they kind of blend their their water because the wells that are producing the good water is a little bit less productive. I think this is for whatever reason, it's like Murphy's law. It's, it's just kind of how it works. You know, we saw a lot of facilities that um, definitely do blend their water and for quality reasons, you know, they have a couple wells that are, you know, 
decent producing wells that are really clean, but then they've got these other kind of five wells or however many wells that are contaminated with something and they have to kind of blend them to get better, better quality water or to reduce treatment costs as well. Um, that was another thing we saw as well. You know, you might have a hard well, a hard well versus a soft well, and you want to, you know, you want to reduce your treatment costs down the line. Um, yes, this is tricky with pump optimization. I completely agree with that. I think that that is where the 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 motivator becomes a barrier. Um, I think you know, again, everybody's motivated by um, reliability and water quality, and that can sometimes become a barrier for some of these. I don't really know if there's um, anything to kind of make it any better. I don't think we identified anything that would really kind of change the game on that, but um, I think it's just a comparison between energy savings and treatment cost savings because, you know, eventually you'll have to treat those those contaminants and that can that can also cost that can also cost a fair amount of money. I will also say I think this is a good time to talk about this, but you know some of the opportunities kind of overlap each other. Um, pump efficiency optimization specifically overlaps with um, what's the other one um, well and pump rehab. So you know you might you might implement well and pump rehab and then you also implement pump efficiency optimization and you know you're you're checking to see when one is efficient but it's not the most efficient one because it got rehabbed a couple of years ago and you know you kind of have these interplay between them and I think that 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 kind of lends itself to starting with one and seeing um, where the others go from there uh, again I, I can't I don't think we can push enough the idea that um, monitoring you know well well flow and energy monitoring is really is really a key portion of this so um i think that will really help help facilities you know what i would add is there's two two pieces that places like chris crookston or or, or uh, of cities that have to blend can do is one look at their blending criteria and make sure that they're not over blending. Uh, the second one is you've got kind of two um, two groups of, of pumps that you have to use. Uh, and with we saw some pretty wide variations in the specific energy used by different pumps, even within uh, groups where blending was occurring. So the idea would be to uh, for the highly contaminated pumps when you that are that are productive, use the most efficient pumps for that. And then when you have to use less production productive pumps, use the most efficient pumps from that group to get your your best efficiency. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. I think time of year is a really big deal because you know. Um, Total pumping really fluctuates a lot throughout the throughout the year. Um, excellent. Um, I think we have time for uh, maybe two more questions. Um, and Mary Sue, feel free to jump in. Uh, we're we're getting towards the ends of end of audience questions. Um, with that as well. Um. The this next question, um, what are what are um, the plans in terms of um, enabling water utilities um, to get access to this research? Um, of course, you know the the card program has mechanisms in place to distribute, um, but any other comments on that? So we 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 plan to distribute it to at least the interviewed sites that we did. You know the interviews that we did, the sites that participated. We plan to send this to all of them. Um, but as far as that, I don't think there is anything um, specifically um, <laughs> in the works right now. But I think that's a great a great way to do it. Um, maybe we can lean on our on our DNR and MDH partners to to help us with that. 
Um, and last question, and um, in terms of time, um, you know, if, if um, we need to be brief, we can. Um, how do the benchmarks you found in the in the interviews compared to the ones that you found in the literature reviews? How how is how does Minnesota um, compare if if you're able to do that, able for, to provide that insight? Yeah, I will. I can give my insight on that, and then I think Carl also might have some some greater insight as well. So, um, from my perspective, you know, we 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 did not find a lot of. I don't think we found anything that was clearly pertinent to Minnesota. Uh, the closest that we found was a study from Wisconsin that actually had a lot of good information in it. But again, it's not exactly the same. So um, we, I don't think, attempted to really compare what we found with what other literature sources found directly. Um, but I would say kind of qualitatively, uh, we, we compare fairly well to national averages um, and I think we have definitely have some kind of high performing and some um, some good plants as well that compare fairly well. The the one benefit that we had, or the thing that we kind of did differently, I think, than other research that we found, other than that kind of like one pie chart that we presented, was we for every site that we did, we benchmarked treatment acquisition and distribution, which really. I think really helps us get a really good understanding of how a treatment facility is operating. I think the overall is a really good place to start, but really what you need again is the specificity of each of the different steps. So Carl, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, but that, that's where I see it. Um, you know, I think in terms of um, national statistics, most of that was focused on total plant specific energy or a benchmark. And, you know, I would say that Minnesota plants were of, of the ones that, that we, the 15 that we looked at were in the, the ballpark of those national total plant statistics. Um, there wasn't anything that suggests that we're better than, than most. Uh, probably some of the where there was a little bit of, of information, more detail on the kind of the three steps within the water utilities acquisition, treatment, and um, distribution. The, the national benchmarks tended to have a larger amount associated with distribution than, than we did, what, what than we found in our sample. And we found a bit larger um, amount of energy that was associated with treatment than the national. But uh, the other thing that I would say is, I think the real benefit of the, the benchmark or the, the energy uh, metric of kilowatt hours per million gallons comes when you apply it to smaller parts of the plant and especially to specific pieces of equipment is that's where you can readily identify some some opportunities and then actually see what happens what the impact is when you when you change make a change okay great thanks lindsay um if you have follow-up questions about this card project feel free to contact one of us i'll just mention here a couple things the recording of this webinar and slide set will be available on the department's website in a few weeks and the final report in a couple of months. Um, and that is one place that you can get a copy of it if you're interested in this um, report or contact one of us and we can send it to you. When available, you can link to either of these, um, either the um, report or the webinar from the quick links on our applied research and development web page. Um, this web page has other resources and information you might want to check out by clicking the link at the bottom of this slide. Um, thanks for participating today. We appreciate your interest in CARD um, projects. The next scheduled CARD webinar will be on July 21st. In it, the Center for Energy and Environment will present results from an investigation that they did for the potential for an expanded scope of boiler tune-ups in commercial buildings. 
um, to keep abreast of upcoming card webinars that are scheduled and all their news related to the conservation improvement program, sign up for our SIP um, updates through the email list. You can link to that um, from this slide. In the meantime, feel free to contact me if you have questions or suggestions for card. Um, and one final thing as a reminder, there will be a short evaluation that launches after the webinar. Um, please take a few moments to fill it out and let us know how we did. Thanks again and have a good rest of your day.